In the heart of a city under siege, a covert plan was taking shape, a secret that could mean the difference between survival and annihilation. Sarajevo, the capital of Bosnia, was in the grip of the longest siege of a capital city in the history of modern warfare, lasting an unimaginable 1,425 days. Its defenders, outnumbered and outgunned, were preparing to fight back in a daring way. The collapse of the Soviet Union had sent shockwaves across the globe, destabilizing the delicate balance of power in Eastern Europe. Yugoslavia, a federation of six republics, was teetering on the brink of disintegration. The Bosniaks and Croats sought independence, but the Serbs, backed by the military might of the Yugoslav army, were unwilling to let go without a fight. Suddenly, Bosnia found itself in the eye of a storm, the most brutal conflict Europe had seen since the Second World War. While the international community, including the U.S. and NATO, grappled with the decision to intervene, the citizens of Sarajevo found themselves trapped in a city under relentless attack, artillery, mortars, tanks, and snipers. Food and water supplies dwindled, and survival became a daily struggle against insurmountable odds. But amidst the ruin, a secret plan was set into motion. A 2,624-foot-long tunnel was being constructed beneath the city's airport runway. This underground lifeline was not just a passage for vital supplies of food and water, but also a conduit for weapons, bolstering their desperate defense. As the citizens of Sarajevo clung to survival, they held on to the hope that the international community would finally respond to their desperate pleas for help. But would the U.S. and NATO arrive in time to save a city on the brink of obliteration? Born in the aftermath of World War II, Yugoslavia served as a vibrant melting pot for various ethnicities. Serbs, Croats, Bosniaks, Slovenes, Macedonians, and Montenegrins found a shared identity under the headstrong yet charismatic rule of Josip Broz Tito. Tito's debt consolidation of power held the Federation's diverse ethnic factors together. However, following his death in 1980, the nation's unity teetered on a dangerous edge. The ensuing decades saw a rise in ethnic nationalism, aggravated further by economic instability. The disintegration of the Soviet Union in 1991 triggered a seismic shift in Eastern Europe's political landscape, undeniably reaching Yugoslavia's front door. Inspired by the power vacuum left in the wake of the Soviet Union's dissolution, some Yugoslav republics embarked on a journey toward independence. Bosnia and Herzegovina, a small faction woven from a rich tapestry of cultures and religions, Orthodox Serbs, Catholic Croats, and Bosniak Muslims did precisely that. On March 3, 1992, Bosnia and Herzegovina voted to claim independence from Yugoslavia, the result of a remarkable voter turnout of 63.4% of the adult population, with 99.7% voting in favor. However, the Republic's Serbs, fervently desiring to remain part of a Serb-dominated Yugoslavia, boycotted the vote. When their objections were dismissed, they began to prepare for conflict, backed by the formidable Yugoslav army. Following Bosnia and Herzegovina's proclamation of independence, intermittent but escalating skirmishes erupted between Serbs and government forces across the new nation. On April 6, 1992, the day the United States and the European Economic Community acknowledged the country's independence, the Bosnian Serb forces made their largest move yet. Led by Commander General Ratko Mladic and bolstered by Radovan Karadzic, the president of Republika Srpska, the Serb dominion within Bosnia and Herzegovina, they laid siege to the capital of Sarajevo, with a population of over half a million. Over 13,000 Bosnian Serb soldiers encircled the city on that fateful morning. From the hills and mountains forming Sarajevo's natural rampart, Serb snipers took positions. Simultaneously, the Yugoslav People's Army established a dangerous ring of artillery around the city. From these vantage points, the Serbs could shower Sarajevo with an onslaught of shells, isolating the capital from the outside world and transforming it into an urban war zone. The strategically positioned Sarajevo International Airport was initially gripped by Bosnian Serb forces, who weaponized it for their offensives. In June 1992, the United Nations Protection Force intervened, initiating negotiations with Serb leaders to repurpose the airport for humanitarian aid. After initial resistance, the Serbs reluctantly relinquished control of the airport, and it was declared a United Nations safe area. This designation allowed much-needed supplies to reach the besieged capital. Still, the area surrounding the airport remained under Bosnian Serb control, and the airport itself lay within reach of artillery, making every operation a risky endeavor. 
As 1992 rolled on, Sarajevo braced itself for a barrage of shelling and sniper attacks. The siege was just beginning. In the heart of the city, Serb forces held sway over critical military locations and had an arsenal at their disposal. Official reports noted an average of roughly 329 shell impacts per day during the siege, peaking at an astonishing 3,777 on July 22, 1993. The main defense against the encircling forces came from the Army of the Republic of Bosnia and Herzegovina, primarily composed of Bosniaks. Initially, they stood alongside Croat forces, but this alliance ruptured in 1993. Ill-equipped and incapable of breaking the siege for years, the residents of Sarajevo focused on survival. Adapting to the incessant bombardment, they collected rainwater, cultivated gardens for food, and cooked on homemade stoves. Despite the brutal conditions and a surge in crime, life persisted within the city. To counter the blockade, the Bosnian government initiated the construction of an underground tunnel beneath the airport. Covertly begun in 1993, it was completed within months. This lifeline, named the Tunnel of Hope by the citizens, stretched 2,624 feet. It functioned as a critical supply route, allowing food, war supplies, humanitarian aid, and people to traverse in and out of the city, connecting it to the Bosnian-held territory on the other side of the Sarajevo airport. Remarkably, this beacon of hope remained a secret throughout the entire siege. As the days turned into months, then years, the siege of Sarajevo surpassed the siege of Leningrad as the most prolonged city blockade in modern history. In the face of unimaginable hardship, marred by ethnic cleansing and unspeakable tragedies, the people of Sarajevo continued to practice tolerance. Every day, Bosnian Muslims lived a shared life with the Croats and Serbs within the city. People also made efforts to keep the city clean and repair damages where possible. Among many citizens, hope lingered that international intervention would eventually arrive to halt the aggression. The world watched in horror as Bosnia descended into a vortex of violence. The chilling scenes of a conflict spiraling into Europe's worst since World War II echoed through radio waves and illuminated TV screens. At the same time, the global community stood helplessly on the sidelines. The United Nations found itself thrust into the Bosnian War from the very beginning. Initially mandated to deliver humanitarian aid and secure safe havens for civilians, the UN Protection Force soon found itself woefully underprepared for the escalating carnage. As Sarajevo's predicament worsened, the government of Bosnia and Herzegovina called for international assistance. Appeals were made to individual nations and to NATO, but the world remained hesitant, unwilling to intervene as the atrocities multiplied. Inside NATO, fierce debates raged. The question of whether this was a domestic issue, or if the scale of atrocities could redefine it as a humanitarian crisis needing military intervention stalled any decisive action. The ghosts of Vietnam and Somalia lingered, cautioning the US and its NATO partners about the perils of engagement in complex conflicts. Consensus was elusive. Meanwhile, the European Union faced heavy criticism for its perceived inertia. The war had exposed the flaws of the EU's emerging common foreign and security policy as it struggled to deliver a unified response. Despite attempts to broker peace and ceasefires, no plans found traction. The US, without direct strategic interests in Bosnia, was initially reluctant to intervene. But as the gravity of the situation unfolded, the Clinton administration shifted gears, advocating for a NATO intervention. Only late in the war, in the aftermath of the Srebrenica massacre, where over 8,000 Bosniak men and boys lost their lives within a UN-proclaimed safe zone, did the world and NATO conclude it was time to intervene. The Bosnian conflict was not merely an internal dispute, but a humanitarian crisis demanding swift and decisive action. The world, now awakened from its inertia, prepared to act in Bosnia's grim saga. NATO had already made some incursions into the war zone, especially in the wake of the Markale Marketplace Massacre on February 5, 1994, when UN Secretary General Boutros Boutros Ghali called for NATO airstrikes. Despite Greece's opposition, the NATO North Atlantic Council approved the strikes under the leadership of U.S. Admiral Jeremy Borda. They issued an ultimatum to the Bosnian Serbs, withdraw heavy weapons from Sarajevo by February 21st, or face the wrath of the skies. On February 12th, Sarajevo saw its first casualty-free day in nearly two years, a short-lived respite as up to 400 NATO aircraft assembled for the air campaign. 
Violence and skirmishes intensified as the Serbs defied the NATO request and prepared to continue strangling the city. By 1995, Bosnian Muslim forces used the opportunity presented by NATO strikes to launch a widespread offensive. Bosnian Serbs seized heavy weapons from a UN depot, triggering UN Commander Lieutenant General Rupert Smith to request further NATO airstrikes. These May 25th and 26th attacks zeroed in on a Serb ammunition dump. In retaliation, the desperate Serbs captured 377 UN peacekeepers and held them as human shields, forcing NATO to suspend its airstrikes for the time being. On May 27, 1995, a disturbing development saw Serb soldiers masquerading as French troops, overpowering two UN posts, disarming peacekeepers, and using two as human shields. France retaliated with military force, further accelerating the confrontations and causing losses on both sides. The growing atrocities committed by Serbs and the use of human shields against airstrikes shifted the winds of international opinion decisively against the besiegers, especially after the second Markali massacre in August. On August 30th, the Secretary General of NATO announced the start of airstrikes and unleashed Operation Deliberate Force, supported by unpro for Rapid Reaction Force artillery attacks. The scheme was designed to put an end to atrocities and the siege of Sarajevo. NATO airstrikes recommenced, even after a French aircraft was shot down by a Bosnian Serb missile. NATO and the UN issued a stern demand for an end to the siege and the removal of heavy weapons from the area. Bosnian Serb leaders were given an ultimatum, set to expire on September 4th. On September 5th, airstrikes targeted Bosnian Serb positions around Sarajevo and their Pale headquarters. The strikes were lethal and devastating, considerably debilitating the siege around Sarajevo. A brief halt in strikes on September 14th allowed for an agreement with the Bosnian Serbs to withdraw heavy weapons from the exclusion zone. With almost no international support and suffering the effects of relentless NATO air raids, the besieging forces were ready to comply. Finally, on September 20th, French General Bernard Janvier, commander of Unpro 4, and U.S. Admiral Leighton W. Smith, Jr. deemed that the Bosnian Serbs had met the UN's conditions, leading to the termination of Operation Deliberate Force. Fighting escalated on the ground as a united front of Bosnian and Croatian forces ignited an offensive, their eyes set on reclaiming the city from the besiegers. Gradually, the Serbs found themselves losing ground in Sarajevo and elsewhere. This strategic retreat allowed the city's lifelines, heating, electricity, and water supplies to be restored. In October 1995, the drumbeats of war were finally silenced as a ceasefire was negotiated. On December 14th, the signing of the Dayton Agreement brought the much-needed balm of peace to the nation, ushering in a period of stabilization. Finally, on February 29, 1996, the Bosnian government announced the end of the siege of Sarajevo. Bosnian Serb forces vacated their positions in and around the city, marking a turning point. Over 70,000 Sarajevan Serbs left Muslim-dominated districts, migrating to the Republika Srpska, their belongings bundled with their memories. The siege of Sarajevo, an agonizing ordeal that stretched from April 1992 to February 1996, left an indelible mark on the city. This enduring siege, the longest of a capital city in modern warfare, inflicted severe physical, social, and psychological wounds, the traces of which continue to haunt Sarajevo. The siege claimed an estimated 13,952 lives, including about 5,434 civilians. The Research and Documentation Center in Sarajevo reports that children accounted for an estimated 1,601 of those who perished. Wounded individuals numbered around 50,000. As a result, the city was left scarred and fractured. Almost every tower and building in Sarajevo, including historical and cultural landmarks, bore the brunt of the conflict. Over 35,000 buildings were reduced to rubble, including the majority of the city's schools and many hospitals. The city's infrastructure was shattered, disrupting essential services like water and electricity. Survival became a daily battle, with residents scavenging for basic necessities. In the war's aftermath, justice sought out those responsible for the atrocities committed during the siege of Sarajevo. The International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, established by the UN in 1993, oversaw these proceedings. Notably, the former Bosnian Serb leader Radovan Karadzic was convicted of genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity, including his role in the siege of Sarajevo. He was sentenced to 40 years in prison, later upgraded to life imprisonment on appeal. 
Bosnian Serb general Stanislav Galish was also sentenced to life imprisonment for his involvement in the siege. The siege of Sarajevo stands as a testament to the indomitable spirit of its inhabitants and a sobering reminder of war's devastating impact on civilians and cities alike.